white table, this table overlaid with white cloth. The greatest sermon for the day is already present. Are you with me? And so I am going to be brief and direct this morning because the sermon, that which must absorb our attention, is already here. I'm going to ask you to bow your heads with me as we pray. Father, even now as we open your word together, please bring home this message to our hearts, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. If you would come with me to the book of John, John chapter 13, we shall share together on this theme. I'm getting a little feedback each time, if you can help me there. John chapter 13, as we examine this subject, so wash me now. Now before the feast of Passover, verse 1, when Jesus knew that his hour was come, that he should depart out of this world, thank you, unto the Father, having loved his own which were in the world, he loved them unto the end. You know, I like God because he does not fail to finish what he started. Now, I didn't know what song was going to be sung by Brother Clark this morning. But as I listened to him singing, I realized he was singing the caption, So wash me now without within. I shared that whatever God starts, he finishes it. The Bible says Jesus knew that his hour was come, that he should depart out of this world unto the Father. There were many times before when he would be implored by those around him to take particular action and he would say, no, because my hour is not yet come. But in John 13, he says he knew that his hour was come, that he should depart of this world unto the Father. Having loved his own, which were in the world, he loved them unto the end. And John is going to demonstrate how Jesus loved to the end. It says, supper being ended, the devil having now put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he was come from God and went to God, riseth from supper. A lot of things are happening in the few verses we've read. The Bible says the devil entered into the heart of Judas Iscariot. My friends, this morning I want to encourage you as we prepare to come to the table of the Lord, you cannot afford to leave your heart up for grabs. Are you with me this morning? Because the psalmist tells me that there is something that we need to do in order to make sure that our hearts are secure. And what did he say? He said what? Thy word have I what? Hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. There was Simon Peter. There was Judas Iscariot. There was John. There was Andrew, there were all the disciples, and Jesus was in the midst. But even though Judas was present in the presence of Jesus, Jesus was not in the heart of Judas. There are lots of people who are gathered at church, but they are not here with a focus on worship. The question had been asked, who is it that will betray you? And Jesus had answered the question. You know, there's some people who, who paint a Jesus that is namby-pamby and afraid to say the truth. But let me tell you something. Jesus was direct. 
Jesus was not vacillating. Jesus was not shifty. Jesus said what needed to be said. So he looked at them in answer to the question and said, One of you that put your hand in this bowl with me, you are the person who will betray me. And I tell you the truth this morning, I wish it not to be so, but I fear less that people seated on red chairs, seated here this morning in sanctimonious garments, getting ready to eat of the body and blood of the Lord, are still betraying the Lord. Because every time that we fail to live up to the obligations of our relationship with God, we betray him. Are you with me? There was Judas. And everybody asked the question, Lord, is it I? And the question went all the way around the circle. I kind of wonder about that guy Judas. I mean, the, the fellow was just, just, just beer face. And some of us are cold, calculated, and callous with our sin. Bold sinners. We sin and think God doesn't know what's going on. But can I tell you something, my friend? God does not weigh things the way we weigh them. Because the Bible tells me that man looketh at the outward appearance, but God looks at the heart. You can turn off the light. God sees in the dark as well as he sees in the light. Are you with me? You can close the door, but you can shut out the eyes of God. The eyes of the Lord run to and fro toward all the earth. So the question came to Judas, and Judas would not decline to ask what everybody else had. Lord, is it I? Judas knew what he was thinking. Judas thought that Jesus was, was kidding on this kingdom thing. You see, Judas was a politician at heart. And uh, I know this is political season, and, and there are some people in God's church who are more energized by the politics of the world than the call of the kingdom. Yes. Judas was a politician. Judas wanted Jesus to take power and run the Romans out of Jerusalem, and Jesus didn't seem to be getting with it. And so Judas thought to himself, I have got to set up a political situation. I have got to put him in a circumstance that will force him to use his power and to realize that he has got this thing made. Everybody around here would vote for him if he just came out and said, I want to be king. He's healed the sick, he's raised the dead, he's opened the eyes of the blind, he's fed the multitude, he, he has walked on water. There is nothing he hasn't done. I mean, that would be the most beautiful outlay for any political poster. Judah saw that Jesus could be crowned easily. In fact, on the triumphant ride into Jerusalem, Judah thought that Jesus was about to set up the kingdom. Instead of the ride ending in joy, some coronation, Jesus was seen at the end of the ride in absolute lamentation. Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that killest the prophet and slayest them that are sent unto thee, how often would I have gathered thee as a hen gathereth her, her chicken under her wings, but ye would not. Jerusalem, it is not I who will destroy you. You have destroyed yourself. When we know what God requires and we fail to do it, it is not God that destroys us. It is we who destroy ourselves because to refuse to come under the coverage of the Almighty is to expose your defenseless head to the raging lion and he will destroy you. And God won't do one kick about it. Because you have the choice to choose his protection or to refuse it. God will not save you against your will. You've got to choose to be saved. Judas asked the question, Lord, is it I? And Jesus never vacillated. He never waffled on it. He said, thou hast said. Yeah. 
And Judas sat there and ate with Jesus. And the Bible says, supper being ended. How long are you going to play, Christian? How long are you going to sit at the feet of Jesus and not surrender to the leadership of Jesus? How long shall you have between two opinions? If the Lord be God, then serve him. Jesus, knowing that, that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he was come from God and went to God, riseth from supper. Let me tell you something. If you choose to side with the devil, you're picking a loser. Are you with me? This guy has lost every war he has undertaken. Because there is only one conquering lion. You see, he is a roaring lion. But I've got to tell you this morning that he is the conquering lion of the tribe of Judah. When Jesus came, they didn't recognize him. He wasn't popular among the elite because he didn't come as they expected. You see, he was supposed to be born in a castle according to common expectation, but he came in a manger. Are you with me? He was supposed to be born a Levite. He was supposed to come through the Levitical line, but he never did. He came as a descendant of David from the tribe of Judah. He did not fit the popular pattern. But can I tell you this morning that he came and because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Oh, isn't it funny that all the theologians in their decorated garments were strolling the streets of Jerusalem filled with self-satisfaction and the king of kings had arrived in a stable and he took strangers, he took men from the east to come and announce the arrival of Messiah. It suggests to me that there are people in church who will not be ready for the second coming of Christ. At the first advent, the world had to tell the church, Messiah has come. But I am going to tell you this morning, my friends, if you don't break up your folly ground, you're going to find out that the second coming of Christ is going to break upon you as an overwhelming surprise. The Bible says he riseth from supper, laid aside his garments, and took a towel and girded himself. Now, when I study the Jewish literature, it tells me that the responsibility to wash feet was the most menial task that a slave could be assigned. And a Jewish slave would not be allowed to wash feet. That slave had to be a foreign slave. It was below the dignity of a Jewish slave to wash feet. And it was the expectation that if you were observing the proper protocol, when guests came to you, when you had anyone of dignity, there would always be the provision of a servant to wash feet feet but you couldn't provide a Jewish servant because that was beneath the dignity of even the Jewish slave you had to find a foreign slave the lowest of the low but the document tells me that there was no foreign slave in that room and so then an argument had been going on in the church who is the greatest whose hat is broadest whose suit is prettiest Ah, who looks the best? Who has the best reputation? And who is God most pleased with? And they, you know, it wasn't a seated opposition as we have. It was a, in in, in the Roman custom was that you reclined. You almost lay on your stomach to eat. And then, if, if I may borrow a word that I don't know if there's any translation in this culture or if you have any idea what this means, but I'm going to say it, I'll look at your eyes and I'll tell if you understand. They just palaw. <laughs> they were at absolute relax. And every man was there 
ensconced in the ivy Torah of his own dignity and nobody was moving to wash foot. Because that's below the dignity of even a Jewish slave and there are no slaves in here. So Jesus got up, peeled off his outer garment and that took some time to do but nobody was moving. Absolutely nobody was moving. Simon Peter says, not me, I was on the Mount of Transfiguration. I'm one of the close three. Are you with me? Yeah. Andrew, James, and John considered that their mother had asked Jesus for special privileges to be assigned them in the kingdom and special privilege could not come as bowing down to wash dirty feet. That's not what my mama raised me to do, not me. Uh, Thomas must have doubted that he could stomach the stench. Because as you walk the dusty streets of Palestine in your sandals, the refuse from the animals that pass through the city would somehow lodge on the sandals and then migrate onto the feet. And by the end of the day, the feet would smell rather colorful. Jesus peels off his garments and nobody moves. It reminds me, I pastored a church in Jamaica. It was on South Avenue. Church raised up by Fitzhenry. For those of you from the uh, island of Jamaica, you may, you'd be familiar with the preacher Fitzhenry. And Fitz preached. Heaven came down and over 500 souls were baptized in that campaign. And 350 of them were kept together at South Avenue under a tent. Piece of property owned by the conference, but the conference could never get permission. The support of those around the property, the businesses didn't want a church in that community because the piece of land was too valuable, they thought, for a church to be built there. And there was continuous trouble about putting a church where we pitched a tent. Massive tent and the South Avenue church was, was the church of love and fellowship. It was a booming, thriving, uh, very, 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 very moving church. My wife will tell you, I enjoyed preaching at South Avenue. Preach at South Avenue. You, even if you got up to preach for five minutes, that five minutes would feel as if you were transported to the gates of glory. Those brethren knew how to worship. And I tell you, it happened. Here I am. Service is beginning. That Sabbath I was uh, on the schedule to preach. And the rains began to fall. The skies opened up. And the trenches around the tent that takes the water away started to fill up. And as the trenches filled up, something happened. It seemed the trenches weren't sufficiently clear. And so water started to migrate from the trenches into the tent. I saw it beginning to spill over. And I watched, and here is a church filled with more deacons than there are letters in the alphabet. Nobody moved. So, I didn't say a word. I laid aside my Bible, slipped off the platform, went into the vestry, took off my coat, rolled up my sleeve, got me my one, uh, what you call water boots, got me one foot of water boots over here, one foot of water boots over here, got me a shovel, emerged from the backside of the vestry so nobody would see me. And I got around there and I started opening the drain, opening the drain. And as I started opening the drain, before you knew it, there was a crowd outside. Everybody trying to take away the pastor's shovel. I said, get your own. Here was Jesus. He took off his coat. Head down. And I don't know whose foot he washed first, but he was going around the circle. And there were individuals feeling well, quite dignified. Can you imagine? The master washed my feet. This is a day to be remembered. Oh, yeah. uh, if, 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 if it were these days, some people would have taken their selfie right there. But when he got to Peter, 
Oh, Peter, Peter has been observing this thing. Peter has been observing this thing. And, 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 and Peter, you know, some people uh, think that Peter just have a tongue that needs to be controlled. But Peter was a guy who just couldn't stomach not saying what was true. He had to say what was true. And so, so as Jesus came to Peter, uh, imagine Peter, he's reclined there and, and Jesus gets around the circle and Peter is watching with great consternation. Jesus is coming in his direction. Peter knows what kind of guy he is. He knows the thoughts he thinks in his heart. He knows who he has been and he knows who that is because he it is who had declared, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. He sees God coming to wash his feet. And Peter cannot imagine the picture and Peter says, No! And he pulls his feet up into his couch. Jesus pauses. He says, Peter, give me the foot. Give me your stinking, blistering foot. Give it to me. Those smelly feet you have up there, give it to me. Oh, my friends, let me tell you something. The greatest thing that can happen to the sinner is to be washed by the blood of the Lamb. You got your stinky feet, give it to me. Give me your sin, give me your heart, and I'll give you my Father's kingdom. Would you be free from the burden of sin? There is power. Come for a cleansing to Calvary's tide. There is wonder, working power. So he looks at Peter and he says, Peter, give it to me. Because if I do not wash your feet, When the real celebration comes, Peter, you won't be admitted. You'll be missing. You'll have no part with me. Can I tell you this morning? Can I tell you? The truth is that we were all born as the devil's children. Jesus says, you're of your father, the devil, and the works of your father, you will do. But my friends, let me tell you that the water... The water of the foot washing ceremony represents baptism. Are you with me? And Jesus was applying the benefits of his blood to the lives of the disciples as an example. Paul would write and he would say, As many as are baptized into Christ have put on Christ. And if ye be Christ, then are ye Abraham's seed. Until you have stepped into the water and have your past washed away, your present justified, and by the grace of God, you begin to walk with Jesus so your future can be sanctified. You're a child of the devil. No matter how good you feel about yourself, you're on the fast road to hell. You're on the short cut to destruction. And can I tell you this morning, there is going to be a traffic jam at the resurrection because many individuals are going to be calling for salvation, but it will be too late. Many will be running to the rocks and the mountains saying, hide me from the face of him that sitteth upon the throne. But let me tell you something, my friends, if you want a rock to seek, seek ye the Lord. While he may be found, call ye upon him. While he is near, let the wicked forsake his way. And the unrighteous man his thoughts. And let them turn unto God. To our God, for he will hear and he will abundantly pardon. Oh, yeah. oh Jesus said to Peter, if I do not wash you, you'll have no part with me. And when Peter understood the importance of the washing, when Peter understood... Peter got jubilant. Peter got excited. Peter turned over. He's no longer reclining on his stomach. Ah, my friends, Peter stuck his feet out. And Peter, 
Peter is about to jump off the couch into the, into the bucket. Ah, Peter, 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 Peter says, Jesus, 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 don't just wash my foot. If what you're talking about, Jesus, is assurance of entering heaven, I don't want to miss it for nothing. You got to wash all of me. Or oh, would you be free from the burden of sin? There is power in the blood. Somebody needs to say, so wash me now. Not next week. Wash me now. Before you come to the Lord's Supper for the small wash of feet. You must have been down to Jordan to the big wash of everything. Are you with me? Because this one point back to that one. This is a reminder that you are no longer out there, you're in here. Are you with me? This is a reminder that what you did yesterday is still powerful today. Are you with me? This is for those who have started. But if you have not yet surrendered yourself to the Lordship of Jesus Christ, stepped into the water and be baptized, then you must cry out like Peter. You must cry out, don't wash my feet. Wash all of me. Jesus said those who have been washed, which means those who have already been baptized, they don't need to have, a, you know, an immersion again as long as they're walking with me. But Jesus says, man, Peter, what I'm doing, this one is for those who have been washed already. And then Jesus said something to Peter. As he talked, he says to all the disciples, I said to Peter, he addresses to Peter, but he's talking to everybody now. He that is washed needeth not save to wash his feet. But it's clean every way. And you are clean. But sadly, he had to say, but not all. We're all in here. And everybody who will come to the table, you have been baptized already. And you're going to wash each other's feet just now. The washing of the feet is a, is a lesson of humility. It is a lesson of humility. You know, some of us are so haughty. We have no idea what it means to be humble. There was a testimony service, and the, the, the speaker, the prayer meeting had spoken on humility. And as the testimony service got started, this, bro this brother jumped up, stuck his hand in the air, and said, sh 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 I, I just got to share my testimony. Oh, I'm so proud to be humble. Jesus says, you call me Master and Lord, and you say, well, 13, for so I am. But if I then, your Lord and Master, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I've given you an example that you should do as I've done to you. I'm going to stop. You should do as I've done to you. The great God of glory, purity personified, stepped from the essence of holiness into the decadence of sinfulness, knelt down before dirty feet and washed them. He came all the way down. Are you with me? He came down, not just to the level of a Jewish slave, but to the level of a Gentile slave. Because in coming down, the Bible says, uh, he, he came down. He came down. He came down. The songwriter would say, he came down to my level when I could not get up to his. Let me tell you something. He came down and the songwriter says, love lifted me. When no other help could be found. Love lifted me. Love from eternity stretched down the hand of eternal sustenance and lifted the sinner from the miry clay. And if you embrace Jesus today and say, wash me now, then he will lift you. Oh, yeah. 
He will lift you from the muck and the dredge of sin. He will lift you, lift you from the stench of the gutter of sin. I don't know what sin you've been practicing, but all sins smell bad. Oh, Jesus was washing dirty feet because no matter what your sin is, it stinks. In heaven's leisure, there is no white sin and black sin. There are only stink sins. The Bible says all your righteousness before me is as filthy rags. Stink. Walking in filth. Jesus came down, just give it to me, give it to me. If I then your Lord and Master have washed your feet, you ought also to wash one another's feet. That's why we wash feet. You know, there are many churches that go to the table and they never wash feet. So Adventists seem strange because we wash feet. But Jesus says, do as I have done. As I have done, do it to each other. For I've given you an example that ye should do as I have done to you. Now I'm going to address one matter and close. Lots of people saying that Francis is a humble man. He was in Poland the other day and he went to the prison and he was washing feet. Everywhere he goes, he goes to a prison and he washes prisoners' feet. But notice what happens when he washes feet. He washes feet. Their feet, they never wash his feet. In other words, he is going in saying, I am in the position of Lord and Master. Because of all the people in that room, there's only one guy whose feet wasn't washed. And that's the feet of Jesus. Are you with me? When he goes in saying, I'll wash your feet, but you can't wash mine. What he's saying is, I'm in the position of Lord and Master. Don't be deceived. There is a nice movie that's been played for the world. The, pipe, the pipe, piper is playing his tune and all the rats are following. For I've given you an example that you should do as I've done to you. Verily I say unto you, the servant is not greater than his Lord. Neither he that is sent greater than he that sent him. If ye know these things, happy are ye if ye do them. Some of us wash feet at the communion service. But we wash only the feet of people we think are in our status. If you're going to wash feet based on class and feelings and we, you know, we are the degree and we are the people who live in certain kinds of houses and wear certain kinds of clothes. Let me tell you something. You're wasting time. Judas was there. But you know what happened? It never made a difference for Judas. And my friend, after you have been exposed to Jesus and you refuse to accept him in your heart, you know what happened? The devil is smiling. He says, as soon as this is over, he's mine. Judas went out. And the Bible says he went out into darkness. He had walked away from the son of righteousness and he had stepped into the darkness. Be careful. Be careful. For if you trivialize what God is saying to you, you shall walk away and find out the path is absolute darkness. If you walk in the light, as he's in the light, we have fellowship one with the other. And the precious blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanseth us. From all sin. I'm going to ask you to stand with me. I'm going to ask you to stand with me. I don't know if there's anybody here this morning. You have not yet given your heart to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. You have not yet stepped into the water. And had your big wash away. And you want to say, Lord, Jesus, I long to be perfectly whole. And I want you forever to live in my soul. I desire what you have, Jesus. I want you to wash me, and I'm not too proud to lift up my hand in this house this morning and to say, Jesus, I'm still dirty with the stench of sin, but I don't want to carry that odor anymore. I want my life to be a sweet savor unto God. I want holiness to characterize me. I want righteousness to dwell in my heart. 
And I know the only way. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. And you're here this morning and you want to say, Jesus, I am indicated my desire. So wash me now. Won't you raise that hand? Raise it boldly. So wash me now. Give me the courage, dear Lord, to make that absolute choice. Would you wash me now? Not yet baptized member of God's remnant church, but you know you need to be. This is a dying moment in this service. The call comes to you. It's personally addressed. Heaven is sending you an envelope. The envelope is Jesus, full of grace, peace, and life eternal.